Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Undergraduate Symposium 3D Award Panel. My name is Shantina Powell, and I'm a senior biochemistry major on the pre-med track and one of last year's 3D recipients. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's 3D Award Panel. The 3D Award acknowledges exemplary student work in the design across diverse disciplines for 3D. The 3D is a crucial component of Simmons' core curriculum, otherwise known as PLAN, in which students create, design, and propose a cluster of three courses that address a topic or issue from various disciplinary perspectives. The 3D narrative selected for this year's panel demonstrate an interest in social justice, an innovative approach to a social, environmental, or otherwise human-centered issue, issue, engagement with underserved communities, and explore a topic through multiple disciplinary lenses. This year's 3D award recipients are Lena Solomon, class of 2023, a public health major presenting the mistreatment of African-Americans and minorities in healthcare. Aaron Buck, class of 2021, a marketing and studio art major presenting food justice and social impact, a holistic exploration of modern hunger. Max Cook, class of 2022, a psychology major presenting politics and self-expression in American music and media. And Catherine Cox, class of 2023, an international relations major presenting women in war. The speakers will each present their 3D narrative. Afterwards, there'll be time for an audience Q&A. Please feel free to submit your questions for the presenters in the chat box. In addition, you will note that there's a live transcript feature um, that has been activated. Um, in order to turn that off, you can just click um, the live transcript button in your toolbar and select hide live transcript. Our first speaker is going to be Lena Solomon. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today and the committee for selecting me to be a 3D Award recipient. Um, my name is Lena Solomon. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm currently a sophomore, and I'm majoring in public health. Today, I'll be presenting my 3D design, and the title of my 3D design is The Mistreatment of African Americans and Minorities in Healthcare. Next slide. On this slide, I have provided statistics that show major health disparities in the United States that are currently disproportionately affecting African Americans and minorities. Um, in, the first, um, in the first statistic, you see that in the United States, the greatest impact and greatest numbers of COVID-19 deaths and hospitalizations have been in African American, Hispanic, and Asian communities. The next statistic shows the maternal mortality rate, but specifically of African-American women. Um, black women are dying at an alarmingly high rate due to pregnancy. The black maternal mortality rate can be attributed to stress due to racism and neglect or lack of ad adequate care from healthcare professionals in hospitals. The next statistic that I have brought today is, of, um, is although African-Americans and Hispanics statistically make up so little of the United States population, they make up a, a significantly large majority of the United States population that is affected by HIV. Next slide. As soon as I had found out about the 3D design, I almost automatically knew what theme I was going to pursue. I've always been very passionate about the healthcare field ever since I could remember. And it wasn't until recent years that I began, I began to hear about the fatalities that many black women face during childbirth. And it was very sad for me to read about these things and just feel helpless. And, and it also worried me because I am an African-American woman. And the fact that I hadn't heard of this had really concerned me. Um, I've always aspired to be a doctor, and ever since I had taken sociology, health, illness, and society, my love for public health had grown immensely. I believe that the mistreatment of African American people and minorities is a major public health issue, and there is history that backs this up as well. And I was able to learn a lot about the difficult relationship that African American people have with their healthcare providers and how it spans through hundreds of years. My hopes and aspirations are to be a part of the change in healthcare that will help people of color become more confident in their healthcare professionals. Also, I aspire to be a part of the change that will dismantle institutionalized racism so that people of color have access to the healthcare they deserve. Next slide. 
My 3D design consists of a cluster of three courses. The first course that I have included, which I have already taken, is Africana Studies 211, Urban Medical Communities. The next course is Public Health 101, which I'm currently taking. The last course that I have added is Sociology, Race, Gender, and Health, which I will be taking in the future. Next slide. Taking the Africana Studies course really opened my eyes to understand why our healthcare system treats people of color unequally. This course has given me the foundation and background history to gain a solid understanding of why minorities typically don't trust healthcare professionals. The underlying and recurring theme or topic that we discuss in Africana Studies was institutionalized racism. Institutionalized racism is a macro level system, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. Institutionalized racism has heavily impacted healthcare, leading to major health disparities and inequities amongst African Americans and minorities. The lack of access to adequate health care has been a major determining factor that has led to minorities dying from preventable deaths due to not receiving proper care or being able to afford proper treatments. Race-based medical practices are still being used to treat patients of color till this day. Race-based medical practices are also very key to the curriculum in medical school, so it is very hard for people of color to receive equal care. For example, many healthcare professionals lead by dangerous belief that African American people have thicker skin and can sustain more pain. The constant mistreatment and experimentation on people of color has led many minorities to garner a strong mistrust in the healthcare system and their healthcare providers. On the slide, I have provided an image of Henry Lax. She's an example of why people of color don't trust healthcare professionals. Her cells were taken from her without her consent and were used across the country and the world to help create some of the greatest modern day scientific advancements. Due to institutionalized racism in healthcare and science, Henrietta Lacks wasn't able to get the acknowledgement and respect that she deserved. Stories like Henrietta Lacks affirm why the mistrust in healthcare is so prevalent amongst minority communities. And a current day example of mistrust is a large amount of African Americans and minorities that are hesitant to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Next solution, I mean, next um, slide. Next, the public health course that I have incorporated in my 3D cluster is Public Health 101 intro to public health and I'm currently taking this course this semester and it has already exposed me to public health threats in our society and it has illuminated how the social determin determinants of health can disproportionately affect people of color and of lower socioeconomic status. Last, the course that I have incorporated in my 3D cluster is sociology, race, gender, and health. In this course, I hope to gain a greater understanding of inequities in healthcare, but specifically towards African Americans, minorities, and women of color. And I also hope to understand and learn more about the intersectionality of race and gender when it comes to health disparities. I believe that both of these courses will help me understand and develop solutions to help create and advocate for a more equitable healthcare system. Uh, next slide. And in designing this 3D has really led me to think about what kind of healthcare professional I want to be. And I personally believe that as a healthcare provider, it is your job to understand your patients, listen to them, and build trust in them. And in the future, I hope to be a doctor that will treat my patients how I would want to be treated. And I also want to be a doctor that will advocate for policy changes and to continue to address healthcare disparities and fight against inequities in healthcare. I would like to end my presentation by urging everyone here today to continue to bring awareness to health disparities that are disproportionately affecting African Americans and minorities in the United States. Also, I would greatly encourage 
everyone to learn more about the history that has led to these healthcare disparities. Next slide. Um, thank you so much again for giving me this opportunity to present my 3D award. Um, if you have any concerns, questions, or just want to reach out, I have provided my email on this slide. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lena. Our next presenter is going to be Aaron Buck. Great. Hi, um, I'm Erin Buck, a marketing and studio art double major graduating this May, um, and I use she, her pronouns. Today, I'll be taking you through Food Justice and Social Impact, a holistic exploration of modern hunger, which I designed in order to investigate hunger and food insecurity through analysis of local, national, and international needs, perspectives, and approaches. On the next slide, I have a quick agenda. So I'll be going over a brief overview of the issue. Um, I'll be also demonstrating a visual just to give more of a, uh, well, visual representation of the problem at hand. Um, I'll be going over my 3D design, my reasoning and takeaways, and then I will be concluding. So first I'll start with a brief overview. Um, so a major challenge when attempting to address global hunger is the scale of impact as we're seeking to solve this complex and persistent issue within our own communities, but also in communities abroad. Um, while the causes may range greatly, we have continued to observe a drastic increase in the number of individuals and families experiencing hunger and food insecurity each year. And currently the UN predicts that global hunger will affect about 840 million people by 2030. In light of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, access to nutritious food has become even more limited for those already or newly experiencing poverty. Next, we will look at a visual pertaining to 2020 undernutrition rates. So just to add some context for the international nutrition situation, I've added the World Food Program's hunger map of 2020, which depicts prevalence of undernutrition in each country's population from 2017 to 2019. The scale is a bit small, um, but essentially it indicates that countries labeled with cooler colors have lower reported rates of chronic hunger, while those with warmer colors carry more of the burden. Generally, where we can see the largest rates of hunger in this model are throughout regions in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America, and the Northwestern part of South America. I included this model as a way to bring up a concept I explored within my 3D, which is that we must avoid actual generalization in our approaches so we can more holistically approach hunger. While the visuals on this map demonstrate hunger's burden on a global and largely quantitative basis, undernutrition and food insecurity are highly complex issues and present themselves at different levels within each and every country. The blue countries in this model, such as the US, certainly carry a lower burden than those with higher acute and chronic malnutrition rates. But even in just looking at one city alone, such as the city of Boston, um, we can easily observe that community level hunger and food insecurity not only exist, but are growing more dire in their need to be addressed. So moving on to my next slide. It's my belief that thoughtful community-centered interventions will provide the best outcomes for affected individuals and the collective. The classes comprising my course design are Business 370 Internship, Econ 100, Principles of Microeconomics, and Nutrition 150, International Nutrition Issues. My plan uses an integrative approach to look at nutrition issues at the local level through my marketing and outreach internship at break time, which is a Boston-based nonprofit addressing issues of food insecurity and homelessness within the greater Boston area. Um, this internship was really the catalyst for my 3D design um, as I was able to truly observe the impact of community-centered approaches. My involvement was mainly in the creation of marketing materials, conducting outreach to potential paid clients and outreach to local organizations such as community fridges and shelters and campaign development for National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. Um, according to Break Time's 2020 annual report, one in eight residents are experiencing food insecurity in Massachusetts, and the state is actually experiencing the largest relative increase in food insecurity rates than any other state at the moment. Um, I'd also say that the work being done at Break Time is both nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive, um, and nutrition sensitive interventions would relate to factors that may indirectly affect access to food like employment and health services. So in their nutrition specific interventions, Interventions. They've delivered over 650,000 nutritious, nutritious meals during 2020 to 
residents within greater Boston that are experiencing food insecurity. And in terms of nutrition sensitive interventions, they provide paid culinary training and employment, financial empowerment programming, um, and just other different career exploration and um, just financial related programming. Um, and they also provide assistance in acquiring housing and provision of emotional support as well. Um, associates and the communities being served are really intertwined and the goal is to build resilience in both individuals within the programs and the communities they serve. At the national level, I examined um, certain things within principles of economics. Um, so the course description of Econ 100 explains that it addresses debates about whether market capitalism provides the best institutional context for organizing the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. So essentially, I decided that I wanted to assess the effectiveness of economic policy in relation to social issues such as food and housing insecurity, and also assess the role of government policy and how our food systems are set up. Essentially, what are we doing and are we doing what we can to ensure that nutritious food is accessible? And finally, at the international level this semester, um, I hope to build a broader understanding of global hunger, learn more about nutrition policy, and evaluate the effectiveness of large-scale nutrition and related food justice interventions. Um, so within Nutrition 150, uh, it involves discussion of interventions at local, national, and international levels, explores the successes and failures of certain interventions, um, and also discusses that effectiveness of one trial in a certain community may not work in another. Um, and it also emphasizes the importance of context, where we measure outcomes and the effectiveness of a given intervention. We have to constantly weigh that against the complexities of the specific community being served. Um, and it also highlights that measurement and management of outcomes is key. So moving on to my next slide, I'm going to discuss my reasoning and takeaways. So when considering which topics I would want to explore within my 3D, I immediately felt drawn to an overarching theme of social impact, questioning how I could most effectively go about creating positive change. Having observed firsthand the impact that Break Time's Double Impact Initiative was having on the community, I felt that exploring hunger at the national and international levels as well would help me develop a clear understanding of who is being affected, why hunger and food security occurs, and what is being done at varying levels to generate positive social impact in response to such a persistent and complex issue. In terms of takeaways, I found kind of what I expected that no one size fits all solution will work at any level. Um, every community's needs are different, every state's needs, every country's needs. Um, so that needs to be considered when making policy. Um, Community-centered approaches really allow us to meet people where they are and create effective long-term outcomes, especially where nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive interventions are being duly employed, like in the break time model. And even the most well-developed solutions may not deliver the expected outcomes. Um, intervention management and monitoring can really help us understand where we're getting the outcomes that we want, but it definitely is a very involved process. And because context varies between countries, we never really know if you know, one successful intervention will carry over into another. And moving on to my conclusion. Hunger and food insecurity have long been and will long continue to be major crises within the global environment. In developing a greater understanding of the issues at hand within local, national, and international contexts, and developing a greater understanding of social impact generation, we may become more prepared to create realistic goals and tangible outcomes. Um, thank you for listening, and please feel free to contact me with the information I provided, and I also suggest looking up break time if you have the chance as well. Thank you, Erin. Our next presenter is going to be Max Cook. Awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Max Cook. I use they them pronouns and welcome to my presentation on politics and self-expression in American music and media. So as a psychology major, this project seems a bit out of my wheelhouse. But after deciding to minor in music as well as cinema and media studies, it kind of aligned more and helped me decide on my 3D project. Uh, next slide, please. So the spread of misinformation has been on the rise in recent years, especially over the past year with COVID-19 and the 2020 US presidential election. As you can tell by this graph from BuzzFeed News, misinformation surpassed mainstream news content on Facebook by 1.4 million media engagements by the end of the 2016 US presidential election. And this has only gotten worse in recent years. 
This misinformation and so-called fake news has caused great misunderstandings and social divides across the country and the world. This problem and my academic interests in the humanities led me to choose the courses for my project that helped me better understand this complex issue and how to combat it through creative media. Next slide. So the courses I chose for this project include Media Messages and Society, or COM 124, Music in America, or MUSE 222, and Resist, Political Resistance in Global Literature and Film, or ENGLE 223, which is a special topics course in the English department. Additionally, I completed a research project on misinformation through my research methods and psychology course, or Psych 203. Next slide. So after taking a course the spring semester of my sophomore year called Media Messages and Society, I began to consider the narratives and intentions of different media more deeply and analytically, including marketing advertisements, political propaganda, documentaries, and news articles, among others. I further explored that through a research project in the fall semester during my research methods and psychology course, where I studied and conducted a mock experiment on the believability of fabricated versus genuine news headlines. Since I already had academic interest in music and other media, I decided to incorporate another course I was taking that fall, Music in America, in which we learned about expression as well as politics through music throughout American history. Through this course, we studied Civil War mar era marches to election propaganda songs and from Appalachian folk music to American musicals. Throughout US history, ordinary people and professional composers alike used music as a form of political as well as personal expression. This then led me to my third class, which I am taking this semester, called Resist, Political Resistance in Global Literature and Film. This course has shown me the political activism and resistance that have taken place in history as well as recent resistance, from the punk performance art activism of Pussy Riot in 2012 to the Selma marches of the Civil Rights Movement in 1965 which we'll see on the next slide. So I have learned through this project more about the different media genres and movements of political activism and self-expression and how to effectively get a narrative across, whether for social change or personal development. Unfortunately, the prevalence of misinformation in media has increased recently, especially in news and political media. Through my research project, I learned that this has to do with confirmation bias, where we are more likely to believe something when we agree with its messaging. Next slide, please. So obviously it's important to be vigilant and surveillant of this misinformation. And some fact-checking sites have been providing us with more accurate information, aided by the rise in these sites as seen by this chart on the right. This misinformation can not only be misleading, but also dangerous when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Even so, it has also sparked and aided the levels of activism and action we see in the media today. In light of COVID-19 restrictions, activists have taken to social media and content platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter to share their art in response to socio-political events of the past year, an example of which you can see on this slide. It is my hope that we learn to critically analyze media to spot misleading information earlier on, combat misinformation with creative and educational media, and use analytical tools to foster meaningful and progressive sociopolitical change. Last slide, please. So thank you so much for your attention to this presentation. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, I included my email as well as a link to my 3D reflection if you want to learn more about my project. Additionally, you can ask any questions in the chat and also during the Q&A at the end of this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max. Our last and final presenter will be Catherine Cox.
Thank you so much. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Catherine Cox. I'm a sophomore studying international relations as well as economics in Arabic. Um, and I was so honored to win this award for my 3D design, Women in War. Through the courses I proposed, I hope to gain a multidisciplinary understanding of the way that women and girls suffer disproportionately in conflict scenarios and how this drives women's views on peace building and conflict resolution. Next slide. According to Professor of International Relations, Laura J. Shepard, gender as we know it is not a concrete truth about the human state. Rather, it is a construct that is solidified through repetition and passed down from one generation to the next. Both the masculine and the feminine are notions of gender that are socially created and practiced by individuals. These notions vary between cultures, societies, states, and families. Yet, in almost every iteration of practiced and created womanhood, violence is a key determinant to the traits a woman is allowed to embody. From the mass rape of civilians by American soldiers in My Lai, to the fact that the vast majority of refugees from conflict are women and children, it is an understood global norm that when conflict occurs, it is women who have to bear the greatest burden. Through my proposed courses, I hope to gain a better understanding of the way that the body constructed as female suffers disproportionately in conflict scenarios and how this drives women's views in conflict resolution and long-term peace building. As Nobel Prize winning activist Lee Ma Bowie once said, women are the ones who bear the greatest burden. We are also the ones who nurture societies. Through my studies, I'd hope to explore the roles of women and girls in conflict in order to understand the different ways in which they're involved in and affected by armed conflict, as well as examining the ways in which gender roles themselves are changed as a result of conflict. And in order to achieve these learning goals, I propose to take two key courses and one internship to help expand my understanding of this phenomenon. Next slide. So the two courses I proposed to take for Women in War were Women, Nation, and Culture and Feminist International Relations. Women and Gender Studies 200, or Women, Nation, and Culture, focuses on the issues pertinent to women's experiences in various cultural, national, and transnational contexts. In this class, I will have the opportunity to analyze the historical and modern experiences of women and their relationship to the state. This class will also allow me to explore the overlapping burdens and intersection, intersecting oppressions created by colonialism, classism, and racism, and how they pertain to a woman's relationship to the state. Political Science 356, or Feminist International Relations, analyzes global politics from a feminist perspective and a gendered perspective on foreign policies, the conduct of war, military, and prospects for development. Through this course, I will study how women are affected by war crimes, genocide, trafficking, and other international conflicts, as well as their role in building global peace. Next slide. Additionally, during my time completing the Simmons 2021 Spring Global Virtual Internship Program, I worked as an intern in women's rights and resilience in conflict situations in Cameroon. Through this virtual program, I was able to examine issues at the intersection of peace, security, human rights, and gender studies, as well as exploring the gender dimensions of conflict by state and non-state actors. During this internship, I had the privilege to work with the Bindumlem Humanitarian Association of Peace and Hope, which is a grassroots NGO working to mitigate the effects of the ongoing Anglophone crisis and COVID-19 crisis on women in the Northwest region of Cameroon. Their organization provides crucial services such as food, shelter, and resources to women affected by the Anglophone crisis, as well as working to empower women on the ground to take control of their lives and become advocates for peace. This program not only allowed me to positively contribute to this organization through grant writing and social media content creation, but it helped me to gain a better understanding of the real life challenges faced by women in conflict settings and what their actual concrete needs are from their perspective. The image on the screen is from one of our weekly meetings with my fellow intern on the top right, as well as our bosses, Madame Bibian and Madame Anita on the bottom and bottom left. Overall, my 3D design combined women in gender studies, political science, and real world experiences to enhance my understanding of women in war. Next slide. One of my major takeaways from this exploration and the connections I made through Simmons to other professors such as Professor Kais at Thomas Jefferson University have led me to begin to explore what some call the queering of gender and conflict studies. Using the theories developed by scholars studying women in conflict, this field, still in its infancy, explores how queer and trans individuals are impacted by conflict, how they're impacted by migration and their experiences in diaspora communities, as well as what their unique needs are in and out of war. Next slide. 
Thank you all so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, um, you can reach out to me through my email address or social media handle listed here. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so now we're gonna start the audience Q&A. So I'm gonna go to the chat and see um, if you have any questions. Um, the first question is for Aaron. And the question is, did you learn anything interesting about the use of marketing um, in these types of social impact projects that you're working on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there were three things that immediately came to my mind when I was thinking about this. Um, first is the question of ethics, um, just because a lot of the marketing that I did um, was done, you know, interviews with associates that we were helping, interviews with people that we were assisting, um, photography, that kind of thing. So when you are, you know, taking part in marketing, ethics is kind of always at the forefront of your mind. So you want to make sure that in this case with social impact, you know, the associates that are being spoken to, like, you know, are they consenting to being involved in marketing efforts? Are we making sure that they feel supported and, you know, fairly represented in the materials we're making? Um, so that was definitely a huge focus of mine. And I feel like it is a bit different than, you know, in a for-profit marketing type situation. Um, another big thing was strategic partnerships. I found that, you know, as opposed to working in just a standard for-profit marketing area when you're working with social impact and you're trying to a get donors and b like make change you need to make strategic partnerships with other nonprofits and organizations in the area and also um for profits they're going to help either fund or um you know repost you on their pages so that their larger audience can see and possibly become donors um so that was really a huge part and i didn't think that outreach and that kind of area would be such a huge part of my internship but it did end up um being really important especially during um our national hunger and homelessness awareness week efforts um and then the last thing i want to mention actually kind of tied into max's presentation but you know viral marketing and you know figuring out how we're going to make content that can easily be shared across different platforms um was huge this year we definitely saw um like social impact um posts and stuff like that being shared more commonly so that was an interesting thing to kind of think through and figure out how we could get the most shares and the most engagement with the content we were making um especially during that campaign that we did Our next question is for all of the panelists. Um, what advice would you give to other students putting together their 3D? I could go ahead and answer that. I would say like, just for myself being a very busy student, like having a major and then at the point I was writing my 3D, I was planning on triple minoring and now it's only like double minoring but definitely like take advantage of your academics. Um, and even if they're like vastly different, like for myself, like being a psychology major and then having two like more humanities based minors, I was having trouble like kind of bringing those together. But then when I was like looking into more like cognitive psychology with that misinformation and media, it all really came together when I started to find the similarities instead of focusing on the differences between those academics. I would also say just um, in developing a 3D, being willing to like work with faculty is huge. Um, you know, I think I knew that I wanted to explore social impact, but I think just having assistance um, from, you know, my like Simmons, uh, like 3D faculty um, just really helped me sort of structure my ideas and make an outcome that I was happy with. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Um, this question is for Max. Um, have you found music to be use a useful means of expression for your own personal political ideas? I would say definitely. Um, as a songwriter, I have like, a bit of difficulty writing on like more real life situations and focus more on like vague ideas but in terms of like music consumption that I have found over the past few years I would say definitely um I know I mentioned Pussy Riot that performance group in my presentation they actually put out a song over um 
the 2016 presidential election with like the same title as the slogan make america great again with like talking about um different human rights issues going on in the united states and over the globe so i found that really powerful especially like since they use the same slogan as the trump campaign and then also um a really great song that I found on TikTok in order like to combat um, COVID-19 misinformation. It's a song that like when the pandemic isn't over just because you're over it. And I found that to be very like, first of all, very catchy. And since it went so viral and reached so many people, I'm sure it definitely like changed minds and really helped to solidify and really combat all that misinformation in media. The next question is gonna be for Catherine. Um, this person wants to know um, what you may have learned or are planning to learn about differences in the way women and men tend to approach conflict um, in addition to the differences you know and how each are affected by conflict. Yeah, um, so I would say while working at the Bindumlam Humanitarian Association of Peace and Hope, um, one of the things they really highlighted um, was the fact that women are often disproportionately impacted by conflict. Um, they face higher rates of sexual violence, trafficking, displacement, and they're often left out of the peace building process. Um, but at the same time, um, women are also not just victims, but they are, you know, tools of empowerment in their community for supporting reconciliation and supporting peace. Um, but despite the fact that women are often leaning towards peace and are crucial peace builders, um, a lot of times they are left out of peace talks between major groups. Um, their voices are not elevated in the political sphere, and this can be a challenge in building regional and global peace. Um, and also in addressing issues that impact women in conflict. Um, the next question is for Max again. Um, you talked about music as political expression. Which example of this do you personally find most moving? So with that, as someone like who's really into music and different media, it's really hard to pick one, but I would say like a really a really great example of that that I saw recently, um, I'm a bit of a fan of musical theater, so I'll probably go down that route, but um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, he actually started a whole coalition based off of one single lyric in his musical Hamilton, the um, Immigrants We Get the Job Done Coalition, and I found Though that's not like directly music, it was based off of the music he had written and I found that to be extremely powerful and it fueled like an entire movement to support dreamers in the United States and in terms of music as political expression, I found that to be extremely moving. Uh, Max, we have another question for you. Um, so someone noticed the other day that a fact-checking function on Instagram uh, was used to center a radical activist with something completely under unrelated. Um, the content was about the carceral state and the fact check was about COVID. Um, from a psychological perspective, do you think the focus on objectivity may tend to skew the understanding of these tools and who gets to decide the narrative? Yeah, so in terms, I guess I'll start off with like the fact-checking AI. So it's definitely not perfect. Um, it's getting better though, because, you know, like AI are constantly learning and we're constantly like testing them to process new information. And while like they may not understand like the context of certain things, I definitely think it's getting better. Um, in terms of your question, the objectivity tending to skew the narrative. Um, I think to an extent, yes. I feel like in terms of like the narrative and the words that people use, those can, those can definitely like skew the understanding and really make it harder for those AI to get their job done. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but yes, I think it definitely depends on like the wording of it and 
some words have like more negative connotations, whereas others have more positive ones. And some phrases, I feel like phrases like fake news might get picked up more than phrases like misinformation, for example, because fake news is more of like a media word where like it's really used to get more views, whereas misinformation is much more academic. Our last and final question is for Lena. Um, have you looked at decolonial ways to practice medicine that are homeopathic? Um, personally, I haven't, but I do plan on, you know, like, um, uh, searching, like, learning more about homeopathic ways and, like, decolonial ways to practice medicine, but I haven't yet. I'm hoping my race, gender, and health sociology course will, like, help me understand that more. Perfect. So thank you all for attending the 3D award panel. Uh, please join us for the keynote speaker panel at 1.50 p.m. Um, the link is at the website that Rachel put in the chat box. Um, in addition, we do have two more panels this afternoon. At 3 p.m., we have sexual identity, gender roles, and motherhood in Spanish film and Mexican literature, which will be presented in Spanish. And at four o'clock, we have representations of Paris in 19th century French literature, um, also presented in French. Um, and the links to those panels um, have been pasted in the chat via the Simmons website. Thank you so much.